the final session, at least here at Caesars Palace, before we show Climate Hustle 2 at the Paris Hotel Casino. And still, there's, there's barely a seat open in the place. It's absolutely lifting for all of us to see such enthusiasm. Thank you, everybody who was here. Thank you for your enthusiasm and dedication. It would not be a Heartland Institute International Conference on Climate Change if we did not have as our concluding plenary speaker, Lord, Lord Christopher Moncton, third Viscount Moncton of Brenchley. It also would not be a Heartland Institute International Conference on Climate Change if we did not have to wrestle with our Lord over time constraints and the Lord Moncton, who has so much for which our entire audience would also like to listen and partake. So with that in mind, I am going to be quick. In fact, I am going to end right now so that we can get right to the meat. Lord Christopher Moncton, the floor is yours, live from the UK. Hello, Vegas. Can you hear me, Strength 5? I hope you can, because here I am. Um, if Greg is there, could you just confirm they can hear me? I can hear nothing from this end. Yes, they can. That's very good. Okay. I'm very, very sorry not to be with you, but I do congratulate you most warmly and the Heartland Institute because the Heartline Institute is just about the last man standing in this climate change discussion. Most of those who were skeptical have run away, faced with the tide of vilification and unpersoning, about which I'm going to talk a bit more in this presentation. But my theme today is the strategic cost of net zero. Because net zero, this policy of shutting down the economies of the Western countries in the specious name of saving the planet from the non-problem that was global warming is a mortal threat to the West. Slide two, please. And I'm going to have to get, yes, here we are. Slide two, please. I'm going to talk, first of all, about communism and energy policy. Now, I have often been taken to task for calling out those behind the climate scam as communists. Now, this does not mean that everyone who has been misled into believing that global warming is a problem is a communist, very far from it. What it does mean is that the origins of this scam, and to a very large extent the motivations for it, had their origin first in Russian and then in Chinese communism, and both of those countries today maintain a very large input into keeping the climate scare going long after it would have been abandoned. Slide three, please. I begin on the 28th of July, 1979. On that date, Arthur Scargill, the Moscow Line communist leader of the National Union of Mine Workers in Britain, took a Polish freighter from the port of Tilbury near London to what was still then Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, and from there he took, as Lenin had before him, a sealed train to Moscow where he was met and taken to the Patrice Lumumba University of Terrorism. The objective of this visit was to train him to organize the miners' strike which the Russians had intended would bring down the Thatcher government as they had brought down the Heath government five years previously. Scargill spent only three weeks at Patrice Lumumba. He was then transferred because his minders realized he was a cut above the rest of them, the sort of terrorist grunts who were trained there, he was sent to the Lenin Institute 
where the leaders of the world's terrorist movements, such as Yasser Arafat, for instance, were trained. There, he spent five months. In December 1979, he took an Aeroflop flight to Paris, changed planes there onto a British Airways flight to London so that he would be seen to arrive not from Moscow and not on a Russian plane. A few years later, he began to try to organize the miners' strike. Next slide, please. And that strike was intended to bring the British economy to its knees. The Russians had long realized that energy lies at the heart of any modern economy. That was why they had rushed into commission various nuclear power stations, including this one at Chernobyl. They were so hasty that A, they didn't build a secondary containment building so that when the reactor blew, everything went straight to the atmosphere. And B, they didn't tell those who were building the power station uh, that the technology transferred from the military had a defect. If the reactor was ever allowed to run at low power, it would explode, which is exactly what happened. Now, our Atomic Energy Authority had visited this reactor some years previously and had come back visibly quaking. And they had said, we would never build any such power station as this in this country. It is rushed and it is highly unsafe. Energy then was something which the Russians focused on very much. Next slide, please. And they realized that since they couldn't compete economically, with uh, us, they needed to try to destroy us. Unfortunately for them, I moved into Downing Street just a few weeks before the strike began. My job was to make sure the strike failed by recruiting uh, a team which would run the strike from outside the government and reporting directly to the prime minister. David Hart, the manager of that team, who was an old friend of the prime minister and of mine, did a superb job at my request he visited every pit in britain and he told every miner he could speak to the history of scargill's involvement with the russians now our miners are not communists they are deeply loyal to this country to the queen and they are not loyal to communism but they were unfortunately too loyal to their union which was at that time led by a communist but David Hart broke the strike. He made the miners realize that they had been led by the nose and that Moscow was calling the shots, and they did not like that. The strike was broken, and that led the Russians to rethink their strategy. They knew they could no longer rely on going through the trade unions. So instead, they began in a large way to penetrate the environmental movement. And that was where things started to become very interesting because they simply didn't realize that the environmental movement were not communists. Here you will see one of the founders of Greenpeace, Patrick Moore, who I think has been at the conference. Now, he's an old friend of mine. He's a lovely man. He's no sort of communist at all. He's a true environmentalist. And so when the communists moved in, and that's his word, he moved out because he realized that they were non-political Greenpeace in those days. They believed in protecting the environment. They didn't believe in playing politics and trying to bring down the economies of the West. So he left. Next slide, please. And from then on, the Russians began using the environmental movement as their poodle. And a remarkable number of the various climate change organizations around the world are either directly controlled or funded or both, either by Russia or by China. And one of the techniques that they have used with great success in order to silence debate, once they realized that people were not really believing the climate scare anymore, is what George Orwell called unpersoning. Next slide, please. And unpersoning was invented by Joseph Goebbels, who was the propaganda minister of the Third Reich. And here you see the Reich's propaganda amt, the Ministry of Propaganda, the one wing of it that wasn't bombed flat by the Allies. And this was the wing in which all the records were kept in Mauerstrasse, Berlin. 
Now, when the Allies deliberately hung back from Berlin in 1945, so as to allow the Russians the honor to capture Berlin in recognition of Marshal Zhukov's undoubtedly very gallant defense of Stalingrad together with General Winter, uh, they found all the records because Goebbels had not believed that the thousand year Reich could be disintegrating about his ears. He ordered all the records to be kept and the Russians got the lot. And they discovered the answer to the question that some historians still ask about the Third Reich. How was it that Germany, one of the most civilized nations in Europe and the world, could have been turned so rapidly into a nation that appeared to be monsters? And this was because Goebbels had used and developed the technique of unpersoning. Everyone who was effective in speaking out against Nazism inside Germany before the Nazis took power knew that their reputation would be trashed in every news medium that the Nazis could bully or influence or that they owned. And this technique was ruthlessly pursued until everybody who might have spoken out or ought to have spoken out fell silent one by one, exactly as has happened in the climate debate. Now, within one month of capturing the records, the KGB, it was then the MGB, had set up their own propaganda unit called the Disinformation Directorate, because it was from the Desinformation. And this was put under the charge of the then head of the Romanian secret police. And that was Ion Mihai Pachepa, who became a great friend of mine because in 1978, six months before the miners' strike began, he defected to the West. He was one of the most senior defectors we ever got out. And so he told us the strike was coming. He told us Skagia was going to be trained in Moscow. We knew what was going to happen. And that's why we were so ready for it when it happened. Now, Pachepa, next slide, please then got to work establishing the disinformation directorate. And he decided to see whether he could take the most saintly man he could find, the greatest enemy of fascism and communism that he could find, and that was Pope Pius XII, who'd been the wartime Pope, and try to trash his reputation. And he spent five years trying to do it. At first he got nowhere because everybody knew that Pius XII had been right at the heart of organizing the pipeline that got hundreds of Jews, thousands of Jews, out from under the noses of the Nazis in Italy and safely away to allied countries where they couldn't come to harm. But Pacepa eventually succeeded by recruiting German playwrights to write plays, suggesting that some sort of shoddy deal had been done between Pius XII and the Nazis, which in fact was not the case. And so after a bit, people began believing this, except those who knew a little history, because the chief rabbi of Rome and his deputy both became Catholics as soon as it was safe to do so after the war. And they would hardly have done that if for a single moment they thought that uh, Pius XII was a Nazi loving Jew hater. But that shows how successful this technique of unpersoning can be. People will even ignore the obvious facts of history if somebody's reputation has been denigrated beyond the point where anybody feels safe in coming to their defense. Next slide, please. And this is exactly what Saul Alinsky recommended in his Rules for Radicals. In several of the rules, he mentions the ways in which you can attack an opponent in an unprincipled and amoral and immoral fashion. He said, ridicule is man's most potent we weapon. Go after people and not institutions because people hurt. Pick the target, isolate it, freeze it, pers personalize it, polarize it, isolate it from all sympathy, cut off the support network, and then bait your opponents into overreacting, and then you've got them where you want them. Now, all of these techniques have been done to so many of us that we know that they're still following this technique, which was originally invented by the fascists under Goebbels and adopted by the communists under Ion Mihai Pachepa, who realizing that what he was doing was wrong and that the West was best, got out in 1978. And very sadly, he died just earlier this year. But throughout his time in the West, he was of enormous value 
to those of us who worked in or alongside the intelligence community. And it's right to pay tribute to him here and to a director of the CIA, whom I shall not name, who was responsible for dealing with him uh, chiefly, and to whom I spoke just a few months ago when we attended, alas, remotely, the memorial service for that wonderful hero of freedom. Next slide, please. Now, arising from Alinsky's furthering of this unpersoning agenda, two sociologists inspired by the evil rules for radicals, Cloward and Piven, and sociologists, of course, is a code word for communists in academia. They had a manifesto, and this was produced in the 1970s, but look how many of the items on it are being implemented today by Democrat administrations. Obamacare right at the top, make people poor because they're easier to control, increase the debt to an unsustainable level. Obama did it first, and now you've got your present president doubling and tripling down on that. Gun control, which they're still trying to push. They've taken control of all aspects of food, housing, and income. Education, they now try to control what people read through the tech giants who are all too willing to accommodate communism. They've even managed to silence or at least defund um, Anthony Watts by not allowing him to have advertising revenue anymore because they disagree with the points of view that he allows to be expressed in his column. And we should give Anthony Watts an enormous round of applause for the patience with which he has endured the nonsense to which he has been and continues to be subjected. And then there is, a, a, there is religion. Of course, they hate religion, so they want to remove all belief in God because that's an alternative belief system that they cannot stand. And of course, class warfare. Next slide, please. So to whose advantage then is this climate communist storyline? Next slide, please. And the answer is in this very revealing slide from the BP annual energy review this year. It shows over the last uh, hundred, over since the Second World War, it shows primary energy consumption on the left and global CO2 emissions on the right. And you can see the two graphs are more or less coincident because very nearly everybody, despite all the rhetoric and all the faffing around with so-called renewables or unreliables as they should be called, is still getting nearly all of their energy from gas, coal and oil, which emit carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere from which it originally came. So we will be looking for those countries which have a surplus of energy supply and are interfering with the energy supplies of the West, because those are the ones that are going to be benefiting. Next slide, please. And here you will see that despite all the rhetoric, King Cole's share of global energy production is greater than it was actually 25 years ago, that should read. And uh, natural gas, of course, is also up. Oil is down. And you'll see that unreliables are up a little. Nuclear is down because, of course, the left have been very anxious not to replace fossil fuels with nuclear because then you have an efficient energy grid again and a very cheap one. I mean, the French... Uh, at one point, we're getting 70% of all their power from a series of nuclear power stations, all robust and built to the same design, the cheapest and most reliable electricity in the world. Now, the left could not endure that. So the campaign for nuclear disarmament morphed into a wing of the environmental movement that opposed the peaceful use of nuclear power to make sure that once they'd persuaded us that we shouldn't be using oil, coal and gas, we would not use nuclear either and we would become third world countries without much electricity at all. Next slide, please. And here you can see that despite all the gab fests, like the one that's coming up in a couple of weeks in Glasgow, the use of coal has greatly increased, use of natural gas likewise, and oil, all three of these are now accounting for a much larger share of total energy than they did 25 years ago. Next slide, please. And let us remember that although Boris Yeltsin overthrew communism, and he himself wasn't communist, he was himself overthrown 21 years ago 
in a silent coup by Putin and his various cronies in what had been the KGB. And here are just a few of the leading members of the Russian governing class that were members of the KGB in 2003, three years after Putin's coup. And in fact, there were some 6,000 senior KGB operatives in positions of authority in central and local government and in all the major agencies of government within three years of Putin taking over. So essentially, Russia was and continues to be run by people who are dedicated to communism and the destruction of the West. And they are angry with us that we succeeded in winning the Cold War. Next slide, please. And that was why when Putin began funding the anti-fracking groups in Britain and Europe, and he does this to a very large degree, and many of them are run by Moscow line communists to this day. He was doing so because he wanted to pipe his uh, enormous supplies of methane gas from Siberia straight into uh, Europe and now through an interconnector it comes to Britain as well. And this is, of course, a disaster because the other day the wind stopped blowing and the sun stopped shining and all the so-called unreliables in Britain didn't produce any electricity and they'd shut down all the coal-fired power stations and all they'd got was natural gas ones. And so Putin then arranged for uh, a ho-ho, an incident that meant that the natural gas supply wasn't quite as strong as it should be. And the price of natural gas briefly went up to 30 times the world price. And we had to pay that. And most of our electricity companies have gone bust as a direct result. And this is the beginning of the communists tightening of their grip. And they can only get away with this because Britain has suffered under a series of remarkably scientifically illiterate governments who have believed all this claptrap about global warming and have forgotten the strategic importance of keeping the lights on. If they built hundreds of nuclear power stations like France, fair enough, but no, they didn't because the campaign against nuclear power was also very strong. So they shut down the coal-fired power stations and then discovered, oh dear me, now we can't generate enough electricity. What are we going to do? So they've reopened some of the coal-fired power stations. Next slide, please. And the other country, the communist country, which of course we should watch very carefully, is China. And as you can see, this is coal consumption by region. Again, a very recent report by, the, by BP. And as you can see, that India, China, and occupied Tibet, in one or two rather smaller countries, between them account for very nearly all global coal consumption. You can see that elsewhere in the world, coal consumption has been in decline, as the climate communists have preached quite improperly against it. It is, of course, the cheapest form of, of reliable electricity. It's only $20 per megawatt hour. And so they've tried to load costs on it by pretending that there's a CO2 penalty for each tonne of coal you burn, so as to artificially raise the price. But it still is something which India, China, and occupied Tibet are burning in very large quantities, and they're planning to increase those quantities. So what we can see from this slide is that nothing the West does now to shut down any more of its economy is going to make any difference whatsoever to whatever global warming may be happening, because everything that we have shut down has been more than made up for by the increase in coal consumption in India, but particularly in China and occupied Tibet. Next slide, please. And here you can see that the Chinese are now playing the same trick as the Russians. They control, believe it or not, 70% at the moment of all the supplies worldwide of lithium carbonate, a vital substance that goes into every electric buggy's battery. So if you buy a Tesla electric buggy, for instance, it will be run by lithium carbonate almost entirely sourced in China and occupied Tibet, which is where most of China's lithium comes from. It isn't really Chinese lithium at all, it's Tibetan, but the Chinese have pinched it anyway. So what China has also done is to support the Taliban so that they, throughout the Allies, 
and took control of Afghanistan, which just happens, though you won't have seen this in most of your Marx stream media, happens to be the world's largest source of untapped lithium. And the Chinese engineers are already in there, ramping up production of lithium uh, in the Taliban's regime. And the Taliban and the Chinese between them are going to make it a fortune out of it. Already the demand is beginning to rise because we're no longer in an energy free market. You can no longer choose whether to buy a diesel or electric or a petrol car. You're going to have to buy an electric car whether you like it or not. And it's going to have to have lithium carbonate in it because nobody else has found a reasonably lightweight material, anything like as good as lithium in these batteries. And the Chinese know this, up goes the price of lithium carbonate. And if you think it's going to stop there at 180,000 yuan per ton, note that it's denominated in the Chinese currency because the Chinese control this market. They will soon have 90% of the world supply once they've got the Afghanistan lithium fields up and running. They're also quietly buying placeholder stakes in the rest. They've just bought, for instance, again, you won't see this in the newspapers, but it is so. They've bought a 9% stake, originally a 12% stake, in Greenland Minerals, which has found large deposits of, of um, lithium in southwestern Greenland. However, the environmentalist movement, partly funded by China, had campaigned against the extraction of that lithium so far successfully, so China reduced its placeholder stake from 12% to 9%. There is a little justice in the world here and there. But now you can see that both Russia with its natural gas and China with its lithium carbonate have a very direct and very strong financial vested interest in making the West believe that climate change is a problem when any serious scientist who's looked at it independently knows perfectly well that it is not. Next slide, please. And I'm now going to look at the reasons why we know scientifically that climate change is not a problem, that it's worth our while doing anything whatsoever about. Now, all the information I'm going to give you now is well known to climate scientists, not at all well known to anybody else, because the climate scientists have become famous by saying, oh, look, it's all far worse than we said. Well, actually, the temperature has been rising far slower than they said. So how can they say it's far worse than they said? Next slide, please. We're going to begin with the first of these three errors, which is that they have failed to allow for the propagation of data uncertainties through the time steps in their models. Next slide, please. And here you will see from Pat Frank's groundbreaking landmark paper of two years ago, that what happened in 2000 was projections were made by the models, but all of those projections which you can see in blue and, and then the emulation in red by, by Pat to show he could emulate it, have a very narrow spread. But the envelope of uncertainty plotted here is uncertainty arising from just one single item of data whose published uncertainty gives you this enormous envelope of uncertainty. And if the models make any prediction that falls within that enormous plus or minus 12 Celsius degrees envelope of uncertainty, then all such predictions are formally demonstrated by standard statistics about which your average climatologist knows nothing to be no better than guesswork. Now, I regard Pat Frank's paper as the most important paper ever published in the field of climate change. And of course, it has been suppressed and to their great shame. Some skeptics who didn't know any statistics either have tried to trash it, but it remains utterly unrefuted in the two or three years since it was published. And Dr. Frank also informed the IPCC of its error and he did so six months ago and has not even had the favor of a reply. They know it's all over by the shouting. Next slide, please. The second of the three errors is one which I'm going to cover very briefly because I've already talked to heart and conferences of it before. The first thing I should say about it is that this error, which we wrote up in a detailed scientific paper and sent 10 months ago to a leading scientific journal, we have still not had a substantive response either for or against it from the editor of that journal who has 
previously gone on record as saying that there's no decent arguments that any skeptics could produce against the climate communist party line. Let's carry on because I've been told by James Taylor that I am to keep this section very short and very concise because he doesn't want me to get too much into what he calls the weeds. And so what I'm going to do is to run through this very quickly. Next slide, please. But in a very simple form. Now, what we're going to do is to start with the equilibrium of the climate in 1850. Why do I say it was in near perfect equilibrium at that time? Because there was not going to be any trend in global warming for the next 80 years. It was going to remain completely flat. So here are the figures which show what went on in 1850. First, the sunshine temperature, 255 Kelvin. Then direct warming by naturally occurring pre-industrial greenhouse gases, about 8 Kelvin. These are just round numbers at this point. So that gives you what's called the reference temperature, the temperature that would have prevailed on Earth without any um, feedbacks in the system. 263 Kelvin, it's 255 plus 8. Then the total feedback response is the difference between that reference temperature and the measured global mean surface temperature in 1850, about 287 Kelvin. So the total feedback response is 24 Kelvin. Those figures are broadly speaking agreed by the climate communists. Next slide, please. Now, the error they made is nicely shown on this slide. You will see that the sunshine temperature has somehow disappeared from the analysis. And what they have said is direct greenhouse gas warming is 8 Kelvin, total feedback response 24, and therefore the total natural greenhouse effect 32 Kelvin. So far, so good. But then they say the system gain factor which is the ratio of the final warming after feedback response to the direct warming before it is 32 over 8, and it equals 4. And from that, and there's paper after paper after paper that gets this wrong, they go on to say that therefore the roughly 1 Celsius, 1.05 Celsius of direct warming by doubled CO2 has to be multiplied by that system gain factor, which we can derive from the position in 1850, has to be multiplied by 4, and therefore you're going to get more than 4 Kelvin or 4 Celsius of warming for each doubling of CO2. Now, what they got wrong, we will now show you. Next slide, please. And here you will see that, sure enough, the uh, latest computer models of climate, you'll find this in Zelinka et al. 2020. You'll have to go to the supplementary matter to get it, but there it is. Direct warming by double CO2 in that paper, 1.05 Kelvin. Currently predicted mid-range final warming in a couple of dozen of the CMIP-6 models that are all in this uh, climate model into comparison project, 3.9 Kelvin, and indeed it is almost four times greater. The reason they think it should be that is because of their way of analyzing the position in 1850. Next slide, please. And here is what feedback response is. It's additional warming dependent upon a proportional to a direct or reference temperature. And at any moment, this is the important point, the feedback processes then present at that moment must respond in strict and direct proportion to the magnitudes of all the components in the reference temperature at that moment. Next slide, please. And from that, we can work out exactly where the feedback response in 1850 came from. And here I begin to use slightly more uh, precise figures. Sunshine temperature, 255.2 Kelvin. Now, 97% of the 24.9 Kelvin of total feedback response in 1850 was feedback response to sunshine temperature for the good and sufficient reason that sunshine temperature represented 97% of the total reference temperature. So the direct natural greenhouse gas warming in 1850 didn't produce 24 Kelvin as they had thought. It produced only 0.7 Kelvin of feedback response. And then, and then all of that you add up and you still get the same temperature in 1850. So there's what they left out. They left out the sunshine temperature. Let's see what happens if you do the maths on 
the global warming we might expect today per doubling of CO2. Next slide, please. Doing it their way and then doing it our way. Now, here you'll see uh, that in 1850, after correction, we're doing this our way at the moment, you take the final temperature in 1850, the measured global temperature, you divide it by the sum of the sunshine emission temperature of 205 Kelvin and the uh, 7.6 Kelvin of um, greenhouse gas warming, that's the natural greenhouse gases, and so you divide the final temperature by the reference temperature, that gives you the system gain factor, it's not 4, it's 1.095. I've calculated it to three decimal places for a reason. We can't, of course, know what it is to anything like that accuracy, but that gives you the idea. Multiply that by the 1.05 Kelvin of direct double CO2 warming, and you get a, an equilibrium double CO2 sensitivity, not of 4 Kelvin, as they had thought, but 1.1. Next slide, please. Now, this is really the the money slide here, because this tells you why, even if they didn't use the models which Pat Frank has already knocked out of the frame, why it is that they can't predict global warming with any degree of accuracy. Now there you see that the reference temperature today, after we've added one Kelvin of direct double CO2 warming compared with today, is going to be about 264.6 Kelvin in bright blue there. Multiply that by the corrected system gain factor, and it gives you the equilibrium temperature that would obtain once all the warming we've caused comes through, and that's 289.7 Kelvin. Today's temperature is 288.7. That gives you a final double CO2 warming of about 1, 1 1.1 Kelvin, exactly as we saw before. But suppose we were to increase the correctly calculated system gain factor just by a tiny amount, altering only the third decimal place and making it not 1.095, but 1.100. Then suddenly the equilibrium temperature is much higher and you take today's temperature from that and you suddenly get a final double CO2 warming. That's two and a half times the value if you use the system gain factor as it was in 1850. Now, here's the point. I can't tell you that the system gain factor today is exactly the same as it was in 1850. I can tell you it very probably is, because in the long history of the evolution of climate dominated by the sun, as you see, 97% of the temperature comes from the sun and very little from greenhouse gases, we wouldn't expect very much of a change in the feedback regime, not even a tiny change. But it is possible, and therefore you could say, well, it might be 1.105 or 1.110. We don't know. And that's why when they tell you we know we're going to get lots and lots of warming unless we shut down the West, they have absolutely no scientific basis for doing so. Their pseudoscientific basis for doing so is rooted in their error in not realizing the extent to which it's the sun that dominates the climate. Next slide, please. So very briefly, why climate scientists were misled. Next slide, please. And here you'll see that on the left, there is the traditional straightforward linear feedback amplifier. And it's quite confusing because what the climate sci scientists did was they replaced the sunshine temperature, the base signal, with the change in temperature. And they forgot, therefore, that the sunshine temperature also gets influenced by the feedback block. Now, if you redo the diagram, as I've done it on the right here, and this is in our paper, um, you can see the base signal and the gain that comes from the greenhouse gases are separately there at the top, fed into a large input-output node, and then into the feedback block, which is the square one at the bottom. And therefore, you can see why it is that the base signal and the gain, depending on what their size is, the feedback fraction at that prevails at that time must respond with in strict proportion to the contributions to that signal that goes into the feedback block. And so a little re-presenting of the diagram, and occasionally you can find a climate scientist who on seeing this diagram suddenly realizes the mistake they've made. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
And the difference between the two system gain factors, here it is, and you can see how simple it is. 32 Kelvin of naturally occurring, uh, the, the natural greenhouse effect in 1850, divide that by the 7.6 Kelvin of direct greenhouse warming, and they say you get a feedback, um, a system gain factor of four. So you'd multiply any direct warming by four to get the final warming because of the feedbacks that make the difference. What they should have done was to add the sunshine temperature of 255 Kelvin to the top and bottom of that ratio. And that brings it down to the 1.095 that we've seen before. So there you see very clearly the nature of their error. Next slide, please. And now we're going to turn to why it is important to look at the temperature record and try not to tamper with it, but to genuinely get it right. Next slide, please. And the first thing we notice is that there has been no global warming for the last seven years and six months. And I bet you haven't seen that reported anywhere in the Mark Stream media. This is deeply inconvenient because these pauses keep happening. And what these pauses indicate is that the climate is much closer to equilibrium with outer space and with the ocean than ever the climatologist would wish us to believe. Next slide, please. And here you'll see a very useful analysis done by my good friend Chris Schoenevelt, where he shows that we've had a series of pauses that go up like the risers of a staircase every so often. And you'll see that at the beginning of each of these rises, there was an exceptionally large El Nino Southern Oscillation, a naturally occurring event that happens typically every four or five years, beginning in the tropical Eastern Pacific, where beneath the ocean, the mid-ocean divergence ridges, and there are three of them that meet under that region, are diverging from one another with magmatic intrusion from below at 10 times the rate that this is happening anywhere else. And the currents then take that warmer water all around the world. And Professor Arthur Vitorito, who has given talks to Heartland before on this, has determined that there is a connection, this is something the late Niklas Murner also found, between the motion of the sun about the uh, gravitational barycenter of the solar system influenced by the two large gas giant planets, Saturn and Jupiter. And that appears to be what's influencing these very large El Ninos, which lead to these spurts in warming followed by long periods without much warming. And so it may well be that quite a lot of the warming we've seen is actually natural. Again, we can't be sure one way or the other. Next slide, please. And the observed warming since 1945, here just putting the trend through the entire period, is equivalent to about 1.1 Celsius per century. Now that figure is quite interesting because we calculated earlier that if the feedback system gain factor that obtained in 1850 still obtains today, as it very well, very well may, then we would expect to see 1.1 Kelvin of warming per doubling of CO2. And the forcing expected by the climatologists this century from all anthropogenic forces is approximately equal to the forcing from a doubling of CO2. So here we have, in effect, a confirmation of the uh, fact that it's more likely that we are right than that climatology is right. Next slide, please. Now we come to the third strategic error, the one ring to bind them all. And this error only makes sense once you realize that Pat Frank is correct, that the models can't predict temperature at all, and that we are correct, that even without models, you can't predict temperature at all. We just don't have enough information and we don't have accurate enough data to do it. And you certainly can't get it right if you get the control theory wrong in the way that climatology did. So we can no longer be anything like as certain as climatology is that there's going to be as much as four Celsius of warming this century or four Celsius of warming per doubling of CO2. Next slide, please. So we now turn to the economics, the candy cane question. You may remember as a kid being given 10 cents by your mother and you go into the local sweetie shop and slap it proudly on the counter from your sticky hand and you say, gee, mister, 
how much candy canes can I get for this? And then the shopkeeper says, well, you can have a dozen or you can have two dozen. But the first question a kid knows to ask is how much bang do I get for my buck? And that question has very carefully not been asked by the climatologists because they fooled themselves with their errors into thinking that it didn't matter what it cost, we had to save the planet. Now, admittedly, it's a great slogan, but the planet doesn't need to be saved. It was triumphantly saved uh, something like 2,000 years ago, and it doesn't need to be saved again. Next slide, please. Now, here you will see that climate communism hasn't altered climate. You see a one watt per square meter increase over 30 years, and it's been in a more or less exactly straight line. There has been no wavering up or down. There's been no drooping off at this end because the West has been busily shutting its economies down. Because, of course, China and occupied Tibet and India are busy ramping their economies up. And what are they using to ramp it up with? They're using coal, of course, while they are paying their propagandists in our universities, in their Confucius Institutes, and the Russians are paying the anti-fracking groups, and the Chinese have literally just paid for a climate change demonstration in the United States. And uh, your intelligence services will no doubt eventually try to tell Mr. Biden that, but we know all about it. And all of this is going on right now, but no change in the rate at which the uh, anthropogenic forcing is increasing. And this is the official NOAA chart. Next slide, please. And this slide is perhaps the most important of all the slides in this presentation. And it's deliberately in quite large print so that you can take an image of this and carry little cards around with this printed on. It will come down to about the size of a beer mat and still be perfectly legible. But this tells you all you need to know about whether it's worth spending any money whatsoever, doing anything whatsoever, about making global warming that isn't happening at the rate they said go away. So this is the cost of net zero emissions. And it also tells you how much warming would be forestalled by those emissions. There's the answer on this slide to the candy cane question. Now, if we were to go straight to net zero by 2050, the forcing that would otherwise have occurred would have been one watt per square meter. And if we go to net zero and do it in a straight line, then we will have abated half a watt per square meter of what would otherwise have arisen. So that is what you buy, half a watt per square meter. But OK, so what does that mean in terms of temperature? Well, first of all, we have to know what the equilibrium sensitivity parameter is, the figure by which you multiply the forcing abated to get the warming abated. And here we're going to use not my figures, not the corrections. We're going to use IPCC bogus figures. They say you're going to get about three Kelvin of warming per doubling of CO2. And they say in their latest report, 3.93 watts per square meter of forcing will arise therefrom. You divide the one by the other and you get the equilibrium sensitivity parameter. This is their figures. You multiply that by the 0.5 watts per square meter of straight line to net zero abatement of radiative forcing. And if the whole world went net zero, by 2050, in the next 30 years, which I'm not going to lead you astray, they're not going to, but if they did, let's pretend, then that would forestall 0.5 times 0.76, the product of the items just above there, three eighths of a Kelvin degree, and that would cost hundreds of trillions. Now, in fact, only the West assuming the climate communists get away with continuing to inflict this nonsense on us through their propagandists in the West. The, we represent only 20% of global emissions these days. So what's 20% of three eighths of a Kelvin? Well, it's one thirteenth of a Kelvin. That's all that the West could do, even if we all went net zero, which of course we're not going to. And then since Glasgow is coming up, and Boris Johnson, I must say, in the intelligence community, none of us likes the idea of a politician holding high office who is sexually incontinent, because it is all too easy for a communist to get alongside him and then use her privileged position to infect his mind with nonsense, which appears to have happened here. Because the UK 
only represent about 1.2% of global emissions. And 1.2% of three-eighths of a Kelvin is 1 220th of a Kelvin. And that would cost us, according to the electricity grid, and these are all other people's figures, $4.2 trillion. And for that, we buy a candy cane that is very small indeed, 1 220th of a Kelvin. And we then look at what we might, what it might cost if we had to abate worldwide the three Kelvin of warming by 2100, that is the current IPCC prediction. And the answer is 2.8 quadrillion dollars. And that's before we correct all these numbers, because the warming abated by global net zero is actually only one sixth of a Kelvin once you make the correction for the errors in climatology's analysis of feedback. Western net zero, one thirty-tooth of a Kelvin, and in the UK, one five hundred and fiftieth of a Kelvin. Next slide, please. So global warming is not a strategic threat at all. Next slide, please. The real threat is climate communism. We're going to look very briefly at the scientific illiteracy of the elite, which has made it so easy for the climate communists to peddle their nonsense and infect uh, all the leading outlets in opinion and also all the leading politicians around the world. Next slide, please. And here you will see the total COVID-19 cases outside China from January the 22nd until March the 13th of 2020, last year. March the 13th was the day on which Donald Trump had the sense to lock down America. Now, what I'm going to ask is for the next slide to be shown, and then we want to go backwards and forwards several times so you can see the coincidence of these two slides. Just go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Because what you'll see is the two curves are coincident. One of them is the actual data in blue there, and the other in red is calculated. And it is a strictly exponential curve, exactly as you would expect at the beginning of a pandemic. Now, Boris Johnson didn't understand this curve. They tried to explain it. Matt Hancock, the health secretary in Britain, didn't understand it either. Stop on this slide. And if they had understood this, they would have realized that if they'd locked down just 16 days earlier, when Donald Trump locked down, they would have saved 50,000 of the 54,000 lives that were lost in Britain just in the first wave of this terrible pandemic. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And here we see a very quick way in which you could end the pandemic. One of the big problems is that some people don't like to be vaccinated. Actually, it makes a lot of sense to be vaccinated. Do not be misled by the uh, very passionate but rather misguided propaganda from those who say that vaccination is dangerous. For most people, actually, it isn't. But just in case you still don't want to have the vaccine, what you can do is asked for the McCulloch Protocol. Now, Dr. Peter McCulloch gave some very impressive testimony in front of the Texas State Senate recently, in which he had worked out a protocol where you put several different compounds together, each of which are cheap, out of patent, easily affordable, and you use these together. And the more of them you use together, even though each one of them on its own doesn't achieve statistical significance in making a difference. The combination of them does. And in his experience, it reduces the risk of harmful outcomes from COVID if you do get it by just as much as the vaccine. And in Uttar Pradesh in India, they tried this out and they were just about the first region in the world to wipe, to, world to wipe the pandemic out altogether. And all you needed to know was this simple equation here, which is an elementary equation from epidemiology. Try explaining that to your typical politician. Next slide, please. And pre-qualification exams are therefore necessary in future for all political candidates. If we are to avoid strategic risks by foreign powers for their own benefit and to our damage, telling us to believe in nonsenses like global warming, we have to make sure that every politician who wants to stand for office is pre-qualified at minimum in logic, mathematics, science, history, and constitutional law. There are plenty of other subjects one could add to that, but that's the basics of it. They've got away with this, these communists, precisely because the governing class cannot so much as work a pocket calculator, let alone differentiate an equation. Next slide, please. 
And so the absurdity of climate communism is what I'm going to wind up with. Next slide. Just look at how silly all of this is. Just stand back. The word that Dick Lindzen used when I talked to him about this the other day was, it's all absurd. They make elementary scientific errors and they refuse to correct them. They tamper with climate data till they fit the party line. They demand diversity, but silence everyone who questions the party line. And that's been done for many of you in this room. You've been subjected to unpersoning. They dismiss academics like poor Peter Ridd, who did no more than to exercise his undoubted academic freedom of expression. But the courts are infected with this nonsense too, and they have just turned him down flat. They demonetize, censor, and ban non-communist viewpoints, just as they've demonetized Anthony Watts. And that's an outrage. Anthony, is, as you have heard in his excellent talk here, is a wonderful, good, and reasonable man. He doesn't deserve demonetization. He needs all the help he can get. And so if you can fling some funds in his direction to keep him going, please do. And while I'm on it, please fling some funds in Heartland's direction too. They need every penny they can get to keep this campaign going. Now then these wretches export emissions to communist China and they export jobs with them. And you've seen that happening in America. We've seen it in the UK. Our last steel works has gone. Our last aluminium works has gone. They destroy Western workers' jobs in the name of the workers. They ban coal-fired generation with the effect of destabilizing grids and hiking the cost of electricity. They install unreliables that actually increase total grid emissions. That's a, a very important result uh, to which Douglas Pollock has recently arrived. He's been working on this for some years and he's now come to the conclusion that in America and in Chile, to name but two, every time you bolt unreliables onto the grid, you increase the total emissions from that grid as well as greatly increasing the cost of electricity, not only on the renewable side of the grid, but also on the thermal side. They're crippling the Western economies with deliberate energy price hikes. They're squandering trillions in return for no commensurate benefit, indeed no measurable benefit at all. They're banning lending for coal-fired power in developing nations. So the very people they say they're doing this in the name of, they're stamping on the poor by saying, you can't have the electricity that was affordable that we had. Well, that's no way to treat the poor. And I'm urging the banks and governments to rethink that one, even if they can't bring themselves to rethink anything else. And then finally, they print trillions to pay for all this climate rubbish. And then they have the barefaced cheek to pretend that that won't cause inflation. Well, all of this is arrant nonsense. It is absurd. And we should never tire of pointing out that that which is absurd, however heartfelt the belief of those who have been fooled by it, it is absurd, and it's time it was all brought to a stop. Next slide, please. Now, the American way. This is where I want to end. Next slide, please. The American way is the way of liberty. Your founding fathers knew that what they wanted was no longer to be ordered about by a distant monarch the other side of the Atlantic. They wanted to run their own affairs. And in order to justify doing away with what was the rather light touch government of the United Kingdom, they decided they had to produce a wonderful declaration of independence, setting out their reasons and amplifying rather to a large degree the grievances they had. But in writing that document and in writing the constitution that would follow, they laid down the eternal principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And one of those principles was the freedom of speech, which is now being silenced by the communist implemented tech giants. They are going to have to be brought in hand and told that they will be taken over and sold off if they ever again exercise any censorship of any form. And they must be told that if they are going to be the platform on which people talk, they must allow people to talk freely in the free countries such as the United States. No longer should we tolerate the restrictions upon our freedom of research, of speech, 
of academic publication that are now being hedged around us by the communists. We must break free of all of that, just as your nation so splendidly broke free from the old country, and yet not too long thereafter became the best of friends. And we stood together, shoulder to shoulder, your young men and ours, fighting for liberty. Sometimes those battles were successful, sometimes they were not, but at least you and we tried. Long may you and we go on keeping the flag of freedom flying. And I end with those wonderful words of your poet Longfellow. Sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union strong and great. Humanity, with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. You are an international treasure. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you speak with us.